Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ray, and welcome to the RayWendelik.com podcast. In this podcast, we'll keep you up to date with the latest app development tech talk. Now, here are your hosts, Drew Freeman and Jen Bailey. Thanks, Ray. This is the Ray Wenderlich podcast. Welcome to episode 11 for season nine. This episode was recorded on Saturday, the 27th of July, 2019 for broadcast on the 4th of September, 2019. This episode is sponsored by Triple Byte. That's Byte, B-Y-T-E. I'm Drew Freeman here with my vivacious season nine co-host, Jen Bailey. Thanks, Drew. Uh, Joining us on this episode is Eric Hellman. Eric works as a freelancing developer, mostly on Android projects, which he has been doing since 2009. He has more than 20 years of experience working as a software engineer on a wide variety of fields and companies. Eric is the author of two books, Android Programming, Pushing the Limits, and Android Recipes, 5th Edition and also does a lot of teaching and talks at tech conferences. When not writing or writing about code, Eric tends to his very small garden and invests too much time and money in coffee making. In this episode, Eric will be discussing Android concurrency. Then in the second half, Jen will help us understand getting into Android for the novice developer. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Very nice introduction. So apparently from your Twitter, it, it sums it all up as COBOL, cats, and coffee. Definitely. <laughs> so, Should I explain on that one? <laughs> well, the COBOL, I'm curious if it really came back and helped out around the turn of the, uh, the, the, uh, the millennia when we, uh, when we had that Y2K panic and all the banks were like, I need a COBOL programmer. <laughs> Actually, no. Uh, my, my interest in COBOL uh, at this level is... Uh, came much, much later, about uh, two years ago. <laughs> I was working on a, with a client and they had their entire backend, I mean entire backend in COBOL. Uh, they had some like newer system in front of that, but the entire core of everything was running, in co- running a COBOL system. Uh, so it sparked my interest and I started learning about it and re- reading about it and then bugging all my friends about it who were not interested. But. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, this also goes back to my dad. My dad was a COBOL developer, so I kind of thought that this would be cool to learn again. And so uh, I, I've been speaking with him about it. And I, I hope that I one day may be doing a talk on this topic because it's actually interesting. Uh, my, I, I've only breathed on COBOL a little, but that was also back during the days when I was taking elective classes in my undergraduate and, you know, I took uh, some Fortran, I took some VMS, um, but they were elective classes, almost as sort of a computer history. The the idea of hearing somebody in 2019 say, yeah, COBOL came of interest to me two years ago. (laughs) That's not a phrase I was expecting to hear ever. That is unusual. Uh, in 1998, 99, when I went to college, of course, the universities were being asked to teach that. So there were a lot of COBOL and Fortran classes. Um, and I missed those. I was a little late. So I started in Java and C++ and Python. But yeah. I want to study COBOL so that I understand the jokes. <laughs> it, Actually, the, joke, a, the jokes are all in Fortran. That's, <laughs> yeah. See, <laughs> that's I'm missing that part of of programmer culture, so yeah, it makes me it, feel like a newbie. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is. Uh, it is actually quite funny to read about it, and like also you'll be surprised how much still runs COBOL. How many, especially the old banks, but also also other businesses who use who who built their entire runs and they're not tech businesses they've never seen the reason to change so they're still running this they don't really have a plan to migrate so they're (laughs) patching it yeah i've worked for a company that still used uh basic so it was a unix flavor of basic they're probably that uh, um languages only customer very few but it's a good product that's the thing you build a really solid product and it can last, you know, 20 plus years, 30 that's, years. That's one of those things where when the job description comes onto my desk and I, I see it's like <laughs> looking for somebody who knows basic or Fortran, I sit there going, is the price tag worth the lack of 
tech acumen this company obviously has. <laughs> It depends. <laughs> yeah, in, in this case, where, where I was, it was actually really cool. It's a, it's a, it's a grocery store chain, and I was doing the a lot of the, well, the apps for them specifically, but also the services you use in store. You know, like the self scanning systems and stuff like that. So, so it was a, like a really wide project, technology wise. So it's uh, it was interesting. And of course, uh, while we touch on the very important stuff, cats and coffee as well, which sounds like a, a an interesting uh, coffee house to go to. <laughs> if you watch at any point during during the season on the YouTube videos, you will definitely see cats going in the background for both Jen and myself. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I, my wife took the cats and. Took them outdoors right now, so they are they're enjoying the sun. Uh, hopefully, not coming here and climbing on my keyboard, which can have some consequences. Um, they and they how, like to do that. And how many are there? Are uh, there two? They're two so, two small sisters. I, I usually include them in my talks. Have them as like the the, the intro video or something like that. It's people <laughs> tend to like to look at cats for you know doesn't matter how long. I love the cats in your YouTube talk videos. So is one of them named Lucy, as I recall? <laughs> Correct. She, she's, well, she's, uh, she's, um, she's the one who will walk across the keyboard here if she gets loose. <laughs> <laughs> I have two young sisters as well. So I have two little nine-month-old sisters. And hopefully I shut the door tight or else we'll be meeting them again. <laughs> yeah, they'll learn how to open those eventually. <laughs> They're very have, crafty. I just have the one... 15 year old matron of the house she <laughs> oh she's gotten to the point now that she wakes us up by pushing stuff off the bedside tables <laughs> yeah. oh, no. and this is wow. how we know that the earth is not flat because cats would have pushed everything off the edge by now yes 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 that's true <laughs> yeah that's definitely true all right and you make your own coffee uh, yeah, uh, so my wife has stopped me from buying more coffee. Yes. <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, so it's like, <laughs> it's me or the coffee things. But <laughs> uh, no, it's, uh, I, I got a bunch of different ones and I use the AeroPress mostly. That's what I like. And I have my own, uh, like I grind my own beans and stuff like that. I've never uh, been a coffee drinker. I'm a tea drinker myself, but I have the exact same policy in my house i have one closet full of teas i used to do my own blends and my wife said until you start drinking more of it you can't buy any more of it so I, I, i'm wondering if this is something to do with tech people they they re, we really have a hard time finding like a good hobby we, we can't find <laughs> we like invent these crazy far out things <laughs> I, I was saying that a few weeks ago that I, I get some of the younger programmers and it's like I code and I code and in my spare time I code and I'm like no 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 <laughs> once you've done this for a while you've got to find something that's not code to do yeah. you have to recover yeah and yeah. um I do tea and coffee so you can imagine how full my mm -hmm. cupboards are I like to grind coffee and um, I have a bunch of loose leaf tea. I'm going to order from that. I can't remember that site you recommended, but it Dry, has a, Dryad. The Dryad tea uh, had an uh, Earl Grey is one of my favorite, and they had a Star Trek themed Earl Grey, I believe. I'm going to have to wow. take that. <laughs> and yeah, the hobbies, tea looks beautiful. So <laughs> Hobbies yeah. are really, I think, important for, for engineers to, to keep them sane. One, uh, two of my favorite Ray Wenderlich folks do Ultimate Frisbee and Ooh. <laughs> interesting yeah no i order my coffee from uh, right now it's from a store in italy so i should ship with it well, since you know european union it's, it's easy to ship within european union so like i order it from there and it's nice and everything comes back in italian so I, yeah hmm. <laughs> so do, um is do you struggle with coffee in the united states i have some friends in sweden and they can't stand our coffee <laughs> no no you, you, I, I don't know you, you don't really do coffee in u.s like it, so you can if you go to like san francisco and go to the blue bottle cafe and stuff you can get good coffee there of course 
But you mean Starbucks coffee is not coffee. That is black water that has been burned somehow. <laughs> uh, my, so when my friends visit, um, they'll like put it, spoonfuls of instant coffee in the in like a espresso <laughs> to uh, try it, try and make it strong enough. It's interesting. So I mean, we got Starbucks here in Sweden as well, but they're not doing well because nobody likes their coffee. <laughs> Yeah, I oh, wish I was more stars. of a coffee drinker. I, I really wish I I, 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 I don't. I'm, I'm not a coffee drinker. So before I get myself in trouble, let us turn to the topic that brings you here to us today, and that is concurrency and async in the Android world. True. Yeah, that is uh, one of my favorite topics. It's also the topic that I find most complex, especially for beginners, but also for people who have a lot of experience, even with Android, we still struggle with this. And uh, yeah, that's what I like to talk about. I, I had an interview where somebody asked me on the interview, do you like doing threaded programming? And I paused and looked at them and said, does anybody like doing threaded programming? Is this a trick question? Because I'll, I'll do it and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it. <laughs> but, but as for liking it, no, it's, it's, it's sometimes a nightmare. So, so let's ask you this right off the top. Why is concurrency and asynchronous such a challenge? Uh, I think that's like most programming you do, you can find an analogy in the real world. Uh, if there's a UI, you can draw the UI on paper. And if it's a database, you can actually visualize like how the data is stored in the tables and stuff like that. So most part work well. But when it comes to concurrency, asynchronous programming and stuff like that, it's really hard to find a real world analogy that you can like, hook onto to, to feel comfortable with the concept. Uh, I noticed this, especially when I've been teaching uh, beginners uh, with Android, I've done that a lot. Uh, the thing that almost everyone gets stuck at is how to do uh, stuff in the background, do how they should handle async stuff, loading data, stuff like that, do it properly. The simplest, the simplest use cases usually work out, but once they get past like the most basic stuff, people get stuck and they, it gets complicated. So yeah, we still haven't solved this in a, in a good way for programmers. So what, what are the current solutions that we have to work with? That's a, on Android, historically, we, we started, we had something called async task and that one, it, it worked. It had a lot of flaws and uh, it got a lot of um, negative feedback, <laughs> let's call it that. <laughs> Is this the uh, the async await? Uh, no, no, no. Async await is coming much later. Uh, so after we had a sync task, Google introduced something called loaders, which was a very complicated API that nobody really understood how it worked. <laughs> uh, and then then came all the Rx stuff, and then came uh, then we got Kotlin, then we got Kotlin coroutines. Uh, but all the while, meanwhile, here people are trying to come up with alternative solutions. Everything from uh, writing event buses for Android or uh, message buses, if you call it like that, uh, using uh, executors and futures in a smart way or trying to replicate the promise API from JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those were, they worked okay, but since they were like third party and not really supported, it wasn't anything standardized. It never catched on really. Uh, I, do, I do still find a lot of code bases where they have their homebrewed event bus going. Uh, the first time we actually came further to making it easier was with Rx Java, but that carries some consequences <laughs> as well. So, uh, and now we have Kotlin coroutines, which is uh, what you said, async await. Uh, we have we have that the concept of async await there. Uh, All right, so let's let's back up and take a look at some of these things. Let's start with the 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 first async, and yeah. it was like a a couple of thousand feet view of how that system works. Yeah, basically you, you extended the class. Uh, the class was called async task. Uh, you, you defined what its inputs was, uh, what the output was, uh, and then you called start on it. And this one then started a thread in the background, performed the work that you had defined. Uh, you could get the input parameters that you give it. And in that, the do in background method that that class has, you implemented your background work and you delivered, you returned the result uh, once you were done. Like now, loading why didn't database. people, oh, excuse me. I was gonna say, why didn't people like that one? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, 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 no, so that was, it was fine for the basic cases, but it also, it, it didn't scale. Uh, it did one thing in the background, so you couldn't combine multiple stuff, and it wasn't what we call today reactive. So, for instance, if you loaded data from a database, and the database, uh, the content of the database changed, uh, you didn't get a new response, a new, new callback. You just got one single callback for every load. So if the, the underlying data was modified or changed, then you had yourself reloaded. So that was one of the drawbacks. Uh, I would say the main drawback with that one. Uh, the loaders that came later was so, tried to solve that one, but that was really hard to use. So, I'm yeah. glad I'm not the only one who I, I thought maybe I was the only one who felt completely lost with that. Because <laughs> when I looked at those, I was like, huh, um, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years and I still don't really understand how loaders work. And like, how do you start them and how do you now? I, I just gave up. And then when RX Java came, I was like, okay, this is better. <laughs> do, let's do this. Okay, so after loaders came RX Java. Yeah. I would say that there was a in between there where we had all sorts of things brewing, but uh, RX Java was the thing that catched on strongly in the Android community, and it solves the problem with you know continuously feeding underlying data up to the user interface. Uh, but it also is a completely different concept of coding, and you don't. It's more about a stream of events, and uh, there's a lot of new concepts that people weren't used to. So in the beginning, me included, we messed up a lot of code <laughs> with this. Uh, so it took a time for the Android community as a whole to, to learn about it, to understand how it worked, how you should use it. But Reactive seems to be this, this wave that's coming across all the platforms now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you you got your own version now in iOS with a uh, combine. I think it's called. Uh, yeah, combine and Swift UI are yeah. are are very reactive in their in their design and nature. It just it it, it seems to be a, a, another programming style that addresses some of these issues, but is it, it is a complete jump to the left. Oh yeah. Uh, it's exactly so you're probably now iOS developers will struggle with the same thing that we in Android did for uh, two three years so um, good luck <laughs> yeah. well you're also you're also talking about the newest technologies that just dropped in the Apple world which of course means they're probably not completely baked as of yet and it's going to be about a year before we really get something that's that that's really meaty enough to 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 start living in yeah, exactly. We had the same thing with Android when we when we first got Arx Java. It was Arx Java one, and uh, it worked for most of the time. But there was some problems, and um, the maintainers uh, who developing Arx Java they noticed this, and we got an Arx Java two, uh, which introduced a bunch of new concepts. And uh, I, I would say that most of the time it's it's the same. There was some new types and some new ways of dealing with what's called back pressure that you usually don't have to think about in an Android application. Very complicated stuff in the reactive streams world, I would say. But overall, the, the Rx Java is, most of the time it's good enough. So a lot of the libraries we have, even from Google, they hook into Rx Java so you can have a database that once it's updated, it emits a new uh, event with the latest data. Uh, all of that works great. But it still uh, it still takes a lot of um, yeah it takes a lot of time to grasp the entire concept, and I still I know Android developers who just stay away from it because not because they themselves don't understand it but they see that junior developers have a really hard time uh, working with it and if you have uh, a small team where members come and go and a lot of junior people coming in. Maybe your company is not a tech company by itself, and the app is just supporting your business. It's 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 not the right choice for you. Which takes us to today with Kotlin and coroutines. Okay, so let's talk about how coroutines differ from all the other systems. So coroutines is uh, actually it it predates both multi-threading and multi-processing. It's uh, I think the first paper was written in the '60s about this. Uh, it's basically 
a, a way to suspend the execution of a piece of code uh, and store that as state machine, and then pick up another execution which has been stored as a state machine and start running that one, and then you swap these between them. So you can run coroutines on a single thread and do it asynchronously. But from a developer's perspective, with the Kotlin coroutines, it's basically just, we, we think it's still threads underneath. We just uh, simplify it. And the, um, it's easier to work with uh, on a basic level. You don't have to think about the operators and the reactive streams and all of those things that you have with Rx. Uh, so you still you can write code that is mostly looks procedural, which is easier to read and mostly for develop, uh, beginner developers. That's, so that's what I love looking at the coroutines is they look a lot more linear in the code and it's not, it's an easier mental model. So you're not tracing your code from location to location yeah. um, and trying to imagine when is this code going to run? It looks a lot more straightforward on the page. Yep, absolutely. And I think that's, I think the, the, the goal, the long-term goal for your code base should be that it should be easy to read for the next developer. You don't know who that person is, if they're a junior or what, that, what kind of background they have. Uh, and if you throw something like Rx on a bunch of junior developers, they are going to mess up the code base because it's really hard to grasp it. If you throw Rx on a bunch of advanced developers, they're going to mess it up, but that's just because <laughs> it's Rx. Yes, that is <laughs> definitely true. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see how the iOS version <laughs> of Rx will, will, will work out. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. That will be interesting. <laughs> so when you're dealing with the coroutines, how do you deal? I, I, I understand that you, know, you, you, you sort of stop execution and start up a state machine for each section. What about values that have to be shared between them? How do you prevent that from getting trample, trampled on? So I, I, I say that the, the fact that it is coroutines and that there is a state machine involved, a suspended execution stuff, most of the developers don't need to think about those details. Those are underlying implementation details for this, uh, for code, code, code routines. I think the best analogy, a lot of developers come from the JavaScript world, uh, whether they go to Android or iOS. Um, so they have some JavaScript uh, experience. So they know about the async await in JavaScript, or at least they know about promises. And if you use, a, if you think about those, uh, a sync await part in uh, in JavaScript, and you say that this is basically the same thing from a high level perspective for the developer. Uh, what Kotlin coroutines is, so you can do await inside a coroutine uh, on a deferred value, something that is loading in the background, mm -hmm. and you want and you want to block the thread where you call this coroutine on. Uh, so so it's, it kind of works out that way. Uh, what you do, you still need to tell, like if you launch, if you're loading data from the network, you still need to say that, okay, this coroutine has to run on the IO dispatcher, the IO threads. Mm -hmm. It's a thread thread pool created there, uh, and then when you go back to the UI, you say, yeah, go back to the main thread here. So, but it's just you, you telling like, okay, this part here must happen on the main thread. This must happen on the background thread, and you can nest these, so it's it still works out. Uh, you, from a readability perspective. Can you quickly go over promises just for our, 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 our novice listeners? Yeah, yeah, so of course, promises in JavaScript is basically uh, the easiest way, since you, JavaScript is just a single threaded uh, execution when you run in the browser, uh, but you can still load things from the network. So when you call like fetch or the, uh, one of these uh, APIs uh, that does something in the background and then delivers a result, uh, when you call the fetch function in JavaScript, you get a promise, a promise object. And the promise object will eventually return a response or an error. So if you do, you, if you, you can add a callback, say this promise, when then this is done, then this will happen. So you can, you can do it with function calls, or you can use the built-in uh, keywords uh, await on a, a promise, which will then, at that line, will wait until uh, it has completed. So it's a really, JavaScript has a really simple way of doing this background loading 
even though it's still just on a single thread. So if you will just suspend that, that piece of the JavaScript, that function that you just called, and then wait until it's done and then resume it. Mm. It looks really neat in code. So Promises was my first experience with code that really looked that way. Like, um, you know, do this and then when it's done, run this block. Yeah. Um, and how do coroutines compare to async await and C sharp? They're pretty similar there too, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you use the C sharp, the async await there, it works pretty much the same. Again, underneath, uh, this is, uh, this is coroutine, so there's a state machine involved and the suspending stuff. So it, underneath it works differently. Uh, in, uh, in C sharp, I think it's implemented with threads and the mutex and stuff like that. So That makes sense. C sharp was my very first experience and I always thought that pattern was superior for a long time until uh, now coroutines, I'm so excited that um, Android has such a fun tool. It, it, <laughs> it is, it is, it's really funny to mention C sharp. Uh, there's a lot of stuff from the C sharp world, uh, .NET world that we that we have seen now, like uh, reactive streams and Rx Java. I mean, it, the, the concept was defined for C sharp at first uh, by Microsoft. Uh, Eric Meyer at Microsoft who did that one, uh, and now um, the async await. Uh, I I I can't swear on this. I think C sharp had async await before JavaScript had it, but I can't. I, I wouldn't, uh, that, <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, we won't least, hold you to that one. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I first used their async pattern in 2007. So, uh, but yeah. it, um, it wasn't quite the same, but similar. <laughs> and I remember having learned threads in school with Java mainly going, this is super cool. And Android wasn't quite out yet or where I could get my hands on it. Yeah. But, I remember thinking, wow, this is a lot easier than threads. I sure wish everything was more like this. <laughs> it's a, exactly, it is like that. And um, I mean, I still find uh, Android code written by like people fresh out of college uh, where they, they implement every background work because they learn that they have to do the background work on a separate thread. So they use, they, oh, goodness. they use the raw threads. I still find that code every now and then. It's us dated professors, and I'm one of the, you know, I'm pretty young for a professor, but it's us dated professors teach what we learned, and you know, that's why it's so important to be out here learning what's relevant and new if you're a teacher. So Definitely. My understanding, because I'm a, a novice Android developer now, as opposed to just an iOS engineer, uh, is that the life cycle in Android is a little different from iOS, and how does the life cycle of the app get affected by these kinds of uh, concurrent behavior, concurrent programming styles. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, glad you asked. It's uh, the reason we struggle so much with the background work is because of this life cycle thing. So let's say you load something, uh, th th you load something in the background thread, uh, and once the data is delivered, you pass it up to the main thread again. The problem here is that if you pass it up to the main thread uh, to be displayed in the UI after the life cycle, a certain life cycle event, like the on destroy life cycle event or on stop or on, on pause, one of these that signals that the app is going out of scope, you are not allowed to touch the UI anymore. If we get the data back there, the process is still running, so it will receive the callback and it will try to update the list or whatever it is you, you were waiting for. Uh, then your app will crash uh, because you're, it's a legal state exception. You're, you're trying to update the, the UI in, um, in the wrong state. Uh, very, very common error. Uh, and it's also like th this doesn't just happen because of the uh, background work. It can happen because you are adding a listener to an animation that just runs on the main thread. So the whole life cycle thing complicates all the asynchronous programming we do on Android. So yeah, so any way that we could make uh, our background work lifecycle aware, and that's what Google did now with, uh, with the new libraries that they came out with. I think it's like they started coming out with them two years ago, but uh, not, now people can use, start using them for real. Uh, so you can have a lifecycle aware background operation. And that makes a lot of difference because now, 
even though the data is loaded, uh, and it, but it happens after a certain lifecycle event, uh, the data doesn't get delivered up to the UI. It will wait there until the app is back and interested in that data, so to say. Okay, so the data is going to sit there and wait for the correct lifecycle situation before it actually distributes. Yes, yeah, sort of like that. So uh, it depends on it depends, of course. But we can we can do things like that. We can wait until uh, the app is back, or we can just hold on to data, or we can discard the data and reload it once you're back, depending on the situation. That is really cool. <laughs> yeah, it it is cool. Uh, there are still like there are still a lot of uh, got, you know problems that can appear and they're like pitfalls there that you can run into because it's still like you have to explicitly say that this background operation here should be tied to this life cycle here uh, and sometimes if you're like deep down in your stack and there's things happening and there's dialogues popping up and you're changing the UI or stuff like that things can easily go wrong so it's getting better uh, most of the problem today depends on that we have a lot of legacy code that people uh, People have not updated to the latest recommended recommended stuff from Google. So you said that while coroutines right now seem to be the best situation, they're still looking for solutions. In in your mind, what is it that's still not quite right with this uh, with the solving problems in concurrency? I think that. I think that we need a better way to explaining concurrency to beginners uh, so that they can grasp like why, how it's happening. Uh, we use analogies in the real world for most of the things, but we're still lacking a good analogy to, to explain concurrency. I mean, even if you have good tools, you still need to understand why, uh, how, how, why things happen as they do, why we do these things here. Another thing is that everything, all of this that we're talking about, the coroutines and stuff like that, is still, is still in flux and people haven't started using it properly. There's, uh, I haven't worked on many apps that actually use coroutines yet, mostly because I, you know, I jump between projects quite frequently. But uh, you know, if you have a working code base with Rx Java, why should you change to coroutines? It's things like that also. But yeah, so my, my main concern right now is we need, uh, documentation that clearly explains and introduces uh, concurrency and asynchronously to, to beginners in a better way. I don't have a good answer, but uh, uh, I, yeah, I would need something at least. <laughs> I would say that when I was at Google I.O., I met multiple people who were really interested in coroutines and like a businessman in, in um, particular said he struggled to find resources about them. So I was proud that um, we have a book, uh, Ray Winderlich. So um, Philippe Babic has written a book on that and um, he's writing a second edition already. Um, and there is, a, I now see there's a Google code lab for it and I definitely hear a lot of people saying, we're really interested to learn this. So as those resources start to filtrate out. Um, uh oh, yeah, definitely. Easier. <laughs> it's always easier when you have a, a base of examples to pull from. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Like, uh, like reference documentation, API documentation is one thing. Sample is another thing that we need more of. Uh, we need like, Code labs, you mentioned those. Uh, and then people learn differently. Some people listen to podcasts. Uh, yeah. Some people listen to video tutorials. Uh, or some people do code labs. Some people like to read a physical book. Or some people like to just code on their own. Uh, so I think that you know, we, will, we will get better. I don't think it's going to solve itself overnight. Uh, I do have a lot of hope that coroutines, uh, Kotlin coroutines, uh, is the the long term solution to all async stuff at least for Android, but maybe even in programming in general, because it is very hard to do it still. In a perfect world, do you see that there's going to be a migration toward coroutines, or do you see it being people will camp out in the RX world and people will camp out in the co coroutine world? Uh, unfortunately, I think that your or the later one will be. 
will be the thing. Uh, there will be fanatics on both sides here. There will be the people on RX side that say, yeah, but coroutines. Uh, and then there will be the coroutine people who say, yeah, but RX. Uh, and they, uh, so they're going to fight each other. And then there's going to be people shifting back and forth. Uh, and this is the thing, the place where I think Google could take a more, uh, uh, be, be more determined about stuff. Like, yeah, this is what we recommend. We like mm -hmm. put their foot down. <laughs> they they yeah. histori historically have been very bad at that. Uh, I mean, there have been like posts written by Googlers who say like, we don't care about your architecture, which means that people do whatever. So we have Android code bases with architecture that are, I don't know, not architecture. <laughs> <laughs> how, how dare you suggest that engineers may camp out in different areas? It's, it never happens, never it ever. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, you're holding out because you want that commitment. And yeah. Microsoft too, it's not just Google, it's everybody. You want the commitment that yes, we're going to move forward in this direction so that you don't build a code base around something that um, very quickly is going to change and you know change with mobile has become every six months every three months whereas yeah. with i remember with microsoft way back um you know we were griping that we'd get an update every two years and it'd break you know little things like that's just so rude how dare they <laughs> and now it's like every couple months um you can just anticipate this flood of change yeah, I, I think actually in this case, uh, Google and other companies should look at how Apple approaches this. They, I mean, Apple barely <laughs> talks about anything happening in the third party community, right? They, they barely mention it. And I think there is a valid point there. It's like, yeah, this is the way we recommend you to do it. And they don't say anything about the other stuff. Um, and it makes it more consistent. It's a yeah, way so more it's more consistent. consistent platform. Uh, it's good in one way, but it's also, you know, it has its drawbacks. You know, you don't have as much innovation in different solutions. So I would say that Google is a little bit too far, or Android is a little bit too far about being chaotic. But maybe Android wouldn't be where it is today if it wasn't. So well, yeah, it's that's, two that's extremes. Always, <laughs> I think that's always been the sort of Apple versus world, which is Apple's always been very tunnel minded on we think you should do things our way and we want to control the entire pipe. And first with Microsoft saying, well, no, do whatever hardware you want and, and Android the same way with every, any hardware. There's a lot of openness to it. And that's going to create polar opposites on people and where they feel comfortable in their programming and in their development worlds. Um, obviously, the people on Apple side are always going to want more openness. People on the Android world are going to want some more control. But in the meantime, you've do got you do have those two ends to to gravitate toward or in the chaotic world beyond both of those worlds yeah definitely but also if we just go back to the, the concurrency thing itself um so jen you meant you mentioned um, professors teaching about like the old style concurrency and stuff like that i think that's the place also where we where computer science educations need to be better be more modern up to date I mean, I remember my lectures in concurrency and multiprocessing, and I have literally have no had no use of that information whatsoever because I mean, we I think we touched upon the Java thread once, but that was it. Uh, nothing of like the higher level stuff that you actually work with. I mean, it's basic fundamental stuff is good, but I would say that you would be easier to teach basic fundamental stuff with a high level tool sometimes. So. I yeah. wholeheartedly agree. That's uh, I, that's why I'm thankful I teach at community college where it can be very responsive to change. Um, and universities, I'm sure some of them are, but I think they struggle more with their political structure um, to change their curriculum on the fly. You know, I can change my uh, my assignments week to week if I need to. And I think these days, especially with mobile, that can be necessary because Android Studio updates and now it's this. <laughs> so why should we move forward any other way? You know, you have to unlearn and relearn. Yeah, yeah. I, d I discover that in tutorials alone is that you look at a tutorial and Android Studio has had two or three revs and sometimes doesn't look quite similar. 
It cha yeah. It'll change on you. Uh, I do my mobile apps class right before Google I.O. And oh. that is living on the edge, I tell you what. <laughs> so I have learned um, I get a lot of Android Studio updates in April and May. <laughs> Mind you, I remember, uh, I remember one RW DevCon where they updated Xcode just two weeks <laughs> before the actual con and, and the word came out going, don't upgrade your Xcode. Just we've got everything finalized, <laughs> locked down for all the demos. It'll break your presentation. I don't know if it's true, but I heard a story that Steve Jobs used to have five or six iPads and iPhones and like one feature would work on each one pre-installed. Yeah, and I have learned, like, when you're relying on some of this stuff, um, people who pre-record their presentations are so smart because you see it all the time, even at, you know, even at Google, not to embarrass them, but <laughs> demos don't work. <laughs> I, I'm rarely at a conference where a demo doesn't slightly embarrass the speaker. The at, demo gods are not friendly. <laughs> demo no, gods no, are no. out to get you no matter where you present. And you get that update right before you walk out there and you think, oh, it's going to be okay. And then it's not. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. I've done that. Uh, I, live, I did a live coding session once. Uh, it was way be before Android. I think it was in 2006. Uh, it was at Java 1. So there was quite an audience. So oh, it, wow. went well. it went well. But I mean, I, would, I, I don't understand why I did that. I probably I was young and stupid. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being young, I always felt feel invincible. I'm like, oh, whatever. I'll just update my computer; it'll be fine. And then, in the middle of the lecture, there's red everywhere. It's you know, I need to do some major code changes. I've got all these poor people spending their time. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> live so and I, learn. I suddenly wonder if it's the same for people who are out in like the Arduino world doing electronics. Like, so I'm going to demonstrate <laughs> these electronics and now these electronics aren't working together. Or is this just something saved for us? We're doing the software side. Or yeah. it like blows up, you know, I suppose with the physical world that could get dangerous. <laughs> That's fun, fun, funny you say. So one of my friends is one of the founders of Arduino and he does a lot of these art installations. And he told me that, you know, once, once they go out, he, they, they, he brings like five like copies of the same, well, five exact replicas of the same uh, setup. To, uh, <laughs> make sure. You know, it's always like that one little thing that failed on that one. It was a glitch there or whatever. So <laughs> I wish I could do that. I mean, I wish I could do that when I do a presentation, just have like five laptops there ready to go. It's like, there you go. I've got one laptop. That's all I can afford. <laughs> Yeah, that, that there. What that's what you need. You need corporate funding. So you need the you know school tends to have multiple computers, um, and they each do have their own personality. <laughs> AKA glitches. <laughs> are the are the ones at your school? Do they have names? Um. Oh wow! I will have to start naming them. They have, of course, little numbers on them. But yeah, I mean, I they, mean, I don't, I don't mean like. You know, computer VR three one five, VR three one six. I mean, because I, I used to, I, I, I think it was at Carnegie Mellon University. All of their computer labs, their computers had thematic names. Yeah, they'd either be that would be fun. There was a there was one computer lab where all of the computers in the lab were named after some kind of natural disaster. There was like hurricane, <laughs> tornado, flood. There was one in the back corner named mankind. <laughs> <laughs> oh no that would yeah. be hilarious yeah, uh, they a, they could use it <laughs> i think our it team might hate us if we put those names on the network but <laughs> oh it can deal <laughs> <laughs> be mean to your it that's always a good idea that's always a fight, uh, not a, uh, that's an area of difficulty at a lot of colleges too, because when you're teaching computer science, you're like, I need it wide open. I need 100% trust, you know, and, and IT's like, no. I don't think you, we should give this to a barrel of monkeys, like a bunch of coders <laughs> and network security, you know, all these people training for these skills. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always, you know, some negotiation um, in the politics there. <laughs> 
Okay, we said the magical word politics, which means maybe we should droll on to the next <laughs> half of the show. Yeah, I was going to say, did we miss anything in concurrency that, Eric, yeah, that you would exactly. want to discuss? No, well, no, I could just sum it up. This is the probably the trickiest and most error-prone area in developing apps or writing code in general, I would say. So we need more, we need more here, more of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very good. Thanks again to Eric for all his wonderful information on concurrency. Coming up in the second half, I will discuss getting started and growing as an Android developer. But thanks again to our sponsor, Triple Byte. That's Byte, B-Y-T-E. This RayWenderlich.com podcast is brought to you by Triple Byte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume, you spend hours and hours on phone screens, take-home projects, and that's assuming the company even responds to your interest or your cover letters. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies, from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them, and if you do well, you get to go straight to the final interviews with the companies on their platform. It's like the common app for software engineers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. And I can appreciate that. Being in the industry for 35 years, I'm entirely self-taught. My undergraduate study was in theater, and I left school to do my first job. So I don't carry a bachelor's, no bachelor's of arts, no bachelor's of science. And that's the one thing I'm often trying to hide or misdirect on my resume. With TripleByte, they care more about the coding experience that I have and not worry about that one little fact. Apply now at triplebyte.com slash ray. That's triplebyte.com, byte, B-Y-T-E, as in 8 bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. And thanks again to TripleByte for sponsoring this episode of the Ray Wenderlich Podcast. We're back in with Section 2, and Jen is going to be talking about how to ramp up as an Android developer and then how to grow your background as a developer. Jen, what have you got for us today? Hi, Drew. Well, today I thought in light of your app evolution that oh, it would yes. be fun to talk about how to get started as an Android developer, um, regardless of your level of experience. So um, this is something I give, I've given many workshops to just to get people started. And I teach an eight-week boot camp. And from there, they grow into experts. So, so I'm very active in Google Developer Group and um, I like to teach Android and kind of specialize in the basics. <laughs> so what you're telling me is that I need to take an eight week trip out to Denver. I failed to mention the fact that my <laughs> iOS app that I talked about on a, on the show with Mark Dalrymple came out and the number one feature the request I have is Android. And over the past week I picked up a, my first Android device, a galaxy a six. There's a plug. Um, <laughs> and and I, I, I swear I'm going to have to buy a book on Android for idiots and morons because it's so completely foreign to me. But I, I enabled developer mode. I got that much done. I went through the first tutorial from, from Ray Wenderlich and, and, and built a Tap Me app. Wonderful. Great. So you are off to a really good start because that is where most people um, – their first obstacle to getting started is actually installing the Android Studio and getting their first um, virtual device going or their first physical device. So it sounds like you've gotten through a lot of those first steps. Um, what I tell people when they're first installing Android Studio is don't give up. And I've had a lot of people, <laughs> and that's nothing against the, you know, Android Studio itself, because it's a, it's a great tool. And very often, um, it goes off without a hitch. So the install goes very smoothly. Everything's fine. Um, but there's very often that it doesn't. And um, part of it, it runs on everyone's operating system. So I've encountered people who get stuck because they have a very delicate, you know, Linux setup or something that's um, very customized. And it's, uh, uh, you know, you have to, so I've known some people who have to like reinstall their OS or do whatever it takes to get it on there because, um, you know, Stack Overflow won't have your particular problem. Um, and and I, these practice, are, 
I'm proud to say that it is rock solid on Catalina Beta 4. That is great. And, you know, these are definite fringe cases. The vast majority of people don't have any trouble at all. But the first pitfall I see people fall into is like, oh, well, that wouldn't run on my machine. And yeah. this goes for every platform. I, as a teacher, I teach three or four different platforms or, or three different platforms in um, many different languages. And I hear this no matter what, you know, uh, Visual Studio won't install, Android Studio won't install, Xcode won't install. Um, it, it, you have to make it install. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's funny that you mention it because my experience is pretty much the same from teaching. I've been teaching boot camps as well. Uh, I have a very interesting course which I give to like non-tech people. And it, it's, it's the same there. Uh, it's interesting. So most of the beginners uh, that I teach, they use Windows still. They, they have a Windows machine, so they can't bring in that one. And halfway through the course, they switch to a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I switched to a Mac. I came to the college as a former C-sharp developer, and I was very Windows. I tend to wave a flag for whatever technologies I use. So I was Windows poster girl. I couldn't find my downloads on a Mac. I hadn't used a Mac since I was a graphic designer as a temp. <laughs> so I got a job as a temp um, typing as a graphic designer. And that's um, the only time I'd used a Mac. So like Quark Express. And, I remember being um, asked on an interview, you know, I was interviewing as a developer and I told them that I did Mac and they're like, well, I don't know Mac very well. Do they have C for the Mac? <laughs> and I just sat there for a moment and looked at them and I said, let me, let me ask you this one. What kind of car do you drive? And they said a Ford. I said, I drive a Saturn. Now, my Saturn takes gas. Do they have gas for a Ford? <laughs> yeah. Where's your tank? On the right? Oh, mine's on the left. <laughs> That's the difference? Yeah. The, 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 the light signal may be somewhere else. The, uh, the air conditioner may be somewhere else. The gas tank may be somewhere else. But it's just another system. And they're like, oh, that makes so much sense. I'll stop asking stupid questions in my interviewees now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I would encourage people to be open-minded and be cross-platform. I mean, that's the world we're living in today. Yeah. You know, we're, we like diversity. Um, so, like, I think it hurts people to be very close-minded. Like, I hate Windows or I hate Mac. And, you know, we all have things that we like or dislike, but um, if you exclude yourself from a platform, you're excluding yourself from tools. But, I, and I was doing that. I was a Windows only. I was kind of not wanting to use the Mac. Now it's my preference. I find Android Studio runs best on it. And I like to also use iOS. So I use Windows for C Sharp development solely these days. And um, I kind of like a Hackintosh with virtual machines for that anyway. <laughs> I, have a qu I have a question for you there. Do you use the JetBrains tool to write C Sharp? Any, Do you, like the writer tool? I have not, and I'll have to explore that because I might prefer it. Um, I have used Mac Visual Studio um, for my beginner classes because they're just console programs. So until you start using Windows-centric libraries, mm. I can use the Mac version of Visual Studio. So 95% of what I do now is on a Mac. And it, when students are shopping, they have a limited budget. So it's hard to tell them, you know, um, to go to that price point um, yeah. when they can get quite a bit of Windows machine for cheaper or even a Chromebook, you know, that's kind of a fringe case, but yeah. Anyway, that's the first obstacle that many people get way sighted because they get really excited. I want to start programming. And Android in particular um, can be a little tricky that way and require a little patience, a little reading. And I also tell people, maybe, I, maybe it's not true, but um, in my experience, about 10 or 15% of your job as a developer is going to be upgrading and learning how to deal with these tools. <laughs> Yep. So you are going to have, you know, maybe one day out of 10 is maybe too many. So maybe I should say 5%, but maybe one day a month, you're going to be reinstalling your environment or tweaking it or fighting with it or updating it. And these things happen. So um, a yeah, lot of times people get really angry. Yeah, there's, there's, a really, <laughs> there's a really good um, saying in one of the large tech companies, no, no names here. It's everything is either in beta or deprecated. 
<laughs> that is a great saying. I'll have to remember that because it's so true. You know, I and always I always think about these people who are always updating their home their home theater systems or or messing with their cars. And I never thought about it because I just take it for granted that every couple of months I'm updating software or, or a operating system. I, I just I don't think about it and. And I know that probably my family, uh, you know, my wife, everybody is always looking at me like, well, he's going to be messing with the computer again today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And every time I, I've just gotten used to it because teaching, you want to stay on the bleeding edge. And so I, re, I install every, you know, all the new updates as soon as I can. And I just count on opening my computer and probably a good half hour of updates every week or so. Every time I open something, whether it's Android Studio or Xcode or Visual Studio, there's oftentimes updates waiting for me anytime I start a task. <laughs> so I, that's I, another thing to just expect. Just expect it and you won't be upset. <laughs> I, I really wish there was like this background update thing going on in Android Studio sometimes because I mean, when they're going to update the virtual devices of the, or whatever it is, so it could be a one gigabyte download and they're like, I don't want to do this now. <laughs> That would be brilliant because, yeah, sometimes if I'm at a cafe and the internet's not great, then I find myself like, this is not a good time to download a huge system image. Um, so that's another thing too. set yourself up for success with really good internet, like have a very st good internet connection. Don't try to install this on a slow internet connection. And be aware that you're the after you get Android Studio running, then you have to go download all the SDK packages, and those include your system images, which have your emulators, and those aren't like the Xcode simulator, which is just a subset. It's like a pretend iPhone. These are actual virtual devices, and they're large images. So I tell people to at the um, at the minimum get your latest SDK. If you're in a book or a course, you could grab the SDK that that is geared towards in case you want to go backwards. But my recommendation is usually, especially with Android, just stay on the recent side of things. So um, should, I hope that's good advice. But I, I just yeah. throw caution to the wind and update immediately and it's become a habit <laughs> yeah, but, I, mean, I mean you only you only talked about like the, the the ones getting started then you have once you're developing you have all your dependencies that needs to be updated and those dependencies when you add them the first time they needs to be downloaded as well so there is a constant downloading stuff in the android development uh, world so to say that is true, and the, and as this isn't so much for the novice, but I think it's relevant to the novice. Is a lot of tutorials. Um, Android X is new, so um, I know with um, our site and with my curriculum, we're moving things very rapidly to Android X, and there's a tool built in for that, so you can migrate a project. And as I'm looking around the web. Not all, and you know, not to uh, to Ray Winderlich's horn or anything, but uh, they always have very current samples. But as you're looking at code samples around the web, uh, beginners get frustrated right away because they open an Android sample and it's not updated to the latest, and they can't run it in their Android Studio. So uh, a tutorial, basically, on how to migrate a tut a piece of code to Android X would be helpful. <laughs> but there's tools in the, uh, um, in the Android Studio itself to help you do that. Because a, a lot of code that exists for books and stuff isn't even going to run when you try to open it. So it's I very say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I will say no. from an advanced point of view, I will suggest if you're thinking of bringing down betas, that you bring them down either as well as the release version or on a separate drive, um, especially if you're dealing with an OS beta. You know, if you're on a Mac and you're thinking of bringing down, because right now we're in our post WWDC months, if you're thinking of bringing that down, be aware that they are specifically meant for developers who are developing to the platform. They're not really meant to live on uh, so have an external drive available for some of these things. If it's, you know, if, if you're developing for Android Studio, then you want the greatest and latest, but you don't necessarily want the not necessarily released yet because it may be 
broken in areas. And the last thing you want is to be working on code and have something blow up on you. That sounds like very good advice for sure. All right, so I got my Android Studio. I've got it downloaded. I've actually succeeded in that process and I have done that. So where do we go next? Great, so um, one thing I recommend just for fun or when I have a chance I like to show a class is uh, the virtual devices. You wanna explore that. Although I think you were um, handy and got yourself a physical device. I started that, with the virtual device. There are little, yeah, the, uh, I don't think too many developers rely solely on the emulators, but one thing that is fun is to make the emulators call each other. So I have a link <laughs> for the show notes because you can, um, you know, use Telnet ports and make them call each other. And that's always fun. And um, you can simulate incoming calls and texts. And so I would say play with that just to, um, and also it's fun to build your own devices in there just to see what's out there. You can look at the watches. And so I like to play with the system images. Um, but once you're at that point, you can run your first app. Then the next thing is to become familiar with the tools. And we already talked about a lot of shortcut keys with um, Hadi, but, um, you know, the ones you really need to remember, I love the shift option A that he told us about. The one quick key to look up other quick keys. <laughs> I think it was one, so, one quick key to rule them all. Yeah, so I am loving knowing about that one. And before that, alt enter is, that to me is like the, not so much the uh, break, but you know, to as a car analogy, that's the emergency break, it's that important. Like alt enter is the one that, you know, is gonna work in your critical situations. Um, and then there's control space for, ba for basic code completion. And I've got some links for the show notes um, that are new even since Hattie's show. Yeah. Um, so I would say learn your way around Android Studio. I, I think um, it's, yeah, sorry. I, I think it's important thing you bring up there, the, the shortcut keys. So my experience with beginners like starting up is that they, they tend to stick to the mouse and uh, use the mouse for everything, marking text, and then they just write the code there or they move around. They don't use the keyboard as much. And if there's one thing I see from like people who are efficient writing code is that they start early with only key keyboard. And that's what I tell my students. Uh, I mean, I used to be a MX developer. I used MX solely for everything before I started with JetBrains tool. I, start, I used JetBrains since basically version two of their tool. And it makes a tremendous difference knowing the shortcut keys. Doesn't matter which editor you use, but if you know the shortcut keys, you're so much more efficient than using the mouse. I think that's something one should push for as well. Again it's or nothing, true. I still do it. I, I, yeah. I use the mouse for too damn much. Yeah, but that's because it, you use Xcode, right? <laughs> Xcode forces you to use the drag motion. Yeah. At least I don't know a way around it when you're creating those connections. Mm. Um, if they're, but other than that, there's a lot of short. I mean, Mac people tend to use a lot of shortcuts. I I notice because especially ones who know Photoshop, that's where the shortcut gurus live. Is people who, because Photoshop has you know five key combinations. <laughs> Um, but I see a lot of beginners fall to the wayside because of frustration using the tool. And um, another thing I would suggest is learn to type. Um, Mavis Beacon teaches typing it was a great program when I was young and it's still out there. And there's lots of resources on the web, but um, for aspiring developers, learn how to type. Um, as people and also learn those shortcut keys because a lot of it is if you're having trouble putting text into the editor that can be fixed with practice which is the good news um, and you'll have so much more time to focus on you know efficiency like you'll be efficient so you can focus on learning the actual concepts so once you've got you know you're you're at your keyboard your keyboard master you've got your android studio going you can move around in it efficiently, um, then you wanna start your first project. So um, uh, the starting project wizard can be a little intimidating because you have to select from all the templates. And I tell people for the first time, just to do a basic activity or an empty activity. And then you're faced with having to name your application and um, the reverse domain identifier. 
And Xcode asks for a lot of the same things. So I'm sure Drew was very comfortable with that. Oh, yeah. so you have to put in, you know, your reverse domain, um, how it's, that'll index your app in the Play Store. And now there, uh, there's a checkbox for instant apps. So if you make that mistake and click that box, you'll get a, a, a template that supports the instant apps, which are very cool, but not necessarily what yeah. beginners would want. <laughs> I, I would, in, the, in that same setup, I think it's worth mentioning uh, the Android version, like mean SDK version, like which, which yes. would be the minimum version. It's because I have, I still have students and actually people online contacted me saying my app doesn't work or this doesn't work uh, because they put API version one because they want 100% coverage. So people are actually like, they, they don't understand what it means. A, a, that number that you get there, like, oh yeah, now you have this one, that's 83%, but I want 100%. So okay. don't really... And yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned that, and especially someone um, like Drew, who's moving from the iOS world, where there's such solid backwards compatibility. That is what one of the major differences when you move from between Android and iOS is you've got this Wild West ecosphere of all sorts of devices. I even have an old tablet that's running gingerbread that I bought on QVC. So I could be the most annoying Android user on the Play Store, <laughs> or one of, maybe not even the no most, but there's a lot of little niche devices that still exist out there. Um, so you can't aspire to 100%, and picking that min SDK um, can be difficult. So uh, my advice is there's a little link on there that says, help me choose. And that's nice, because you can see a bar graph of, if I choose this version, it's this many, this much coverage. Um, and you really just want to think about the audience for your app. Is this, you know, new and trendy and I need to showcase the latest thing on the newest pixel? Or is this something more common that I want to work for people who bought, you know, a tablet on QVC 10 years ago? Well, I think there also is the question of, I need this specific OS feature. That, yes, that's that's got to play into it. I mean, one of, for, for example, the reason that I got my Galaxy wasn't because I necessarily needed to have an in-hand device, but my app requires location. Oh, yeah. And that's something that I understand that the emulators can fake but don't do very well. So if I need to do location, if I need to see it getting updates for location changes, I need a device in hand. But if location is something that's specifically in one SDK or the other, I can't just say, well, I'm going to go earlier to, to get my audience. I'm going to have to tell my audience, this is a major feature of my app. Therefore, you're going to have to be on this OS to use it. You know, if I'm, if I'm writing some beautiful machine learning AR app, I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit that we're not going back to, to like G or H. Yeah, that, that is a very, that is exactly true because you need to target, you know, what's going to give you, think of your app too, what's the features, what's going to meet your audience's needs, um, and it's always striking a balance, so reaching perfection there isn't going to happen, and that's, uh, that can be frustrating to developers coming from another platform because mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, iPads from way back when are the same, are pretty much the same. Um, yeah. So that that always irks me a little bit. Like, what about those couple of users out there that I so, can't reach? So, so, so there is there is an interesting thing to mention here also. That if we should like first make a, a solid advice to people who are building a new app, what main SDK version should they pick? Uh, a year ago, I would say uh, API level twenty one. That's Android five point zero. Uh, these days, I say no, no, no. You can go like uh, Android six point zero API level twenty three today because that it, it will cover enough users that you will be you will reach a large enough market. People who are still on API level 21, Android 5.0, they are also very unlikely to install new apps. Oh, that is a really good insight because it's always hard for me to know what is the right recommendation, you know, the default. So that is a great consideration. I hadn't thought of that. That's really good. And 
and and, and this this uh, you know every year you should consider this again. What is the minimum one I can I can bump now? So if your app was was released with API level twenty one, this year you might be able to bump it to twenty three. This means that your existing users on the API level twenty one they won't lose the app. They won't just get the new update. They will get they will retain the old app that you had. So they won't be kicked out, so to say. That is uh, super smart. Um, Does the Android store keep uh, versions for 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 unsupported? For example, if my app were released in one point oh for 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 twenty one, then I release for twenty three. Are the are the people who are on twenty one still going to be able to get that one point oh off the store? If they have installed the app once. They can they can go back and see that with that device. So the existing users on twenty one can still get the app. Mm -hmm. So, but new users they need to be on the on the later version. But this this is I mean new users will have a newer device usually. Yeah. So that's that's why this reasoning is good. So you should bump it as much as possible because old versions bring in a lot of bugs and the, those they bring in more bugs than newer version and so this this disproportion yeah i noticed with the new device that i got uh android version 9 which i'm pretty sure is p so since it was a new device it's got one of the latest android versions on it and and as people get their new devices i guess they're getting later and later os's yeah exactly i think that you could expect people to get a new device every second or third year uh, like most people uh, and that you know when they buy a new device they will have maybe not uh, maybe not if they would buy a device today they probably will get Android P or Android O depending on which vendor they go to but one of those two latest ones so, beta Q yeah <laughs> that's one of the things that's so rewarding about being an Android developer because I like the different pro um, like platforms but the devices are affordable and now there's even Android Go. There's even a Pixel I can afford now. Um, so I love that I can a lot of times put my hands on the technology a little easier on my budget. Um, and so you do see people upgrading. People who are fans of Android can upgrade a lot more often. <laughs> uh, depending, you know, some of us really like the expensive, sometimes I like the more expensive model, but if I want just something stock to play with, I can usually afford something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so we have got Android downloaded. We are familiar with it, and we know approximately which OS we're going to be supporting in the app. Great. So now, um, now you want to um, run your first program. So you go through that wizard, and um, that creates a hello world. So. That is an um, adequate app to test your setup. At that point, you want to run it and see it launch. And um, the moment that you, that happens and you don't have a crash, you can you know, give yourself a big round of applause because you've survived um, one of the harder tasks. <laughs> Once you're at that point, things are going to smooth out for you a little bit if, if you had any trouble. So a vast majority of people don't have trouble. Um, sometimes people have lots of trouble and, you know, they're really happy to reach that milestone. Um, the next thing to look at is the anatomy of the actual app. So knowing where things are in there can be a little uh, daunting. Um, you have a res folder and that's where you're going to find your layouts or your images. In Android, um, we have strings XML, which is really cool because you put any piece of text in your app in there. And same with dimensions um, and colors. So you can define all these XML files in the res folder to keep your color theme, your styles, your strings, and that'll make translation easier later. And so that's something you don't have to do in iOS or in Microsoft is keep that. And um, for you, you would probably want to use constraint layout the most. So, you know, you want to pull up one of those layouts and see it in the visual editor. Um, so you'll be opening like main activity.xml and take a look at that and click around in there. Um, and what's neat that's different in Android uh, over iOS is the text editor. You have a design view and a text view. Many developers start out in the design view, drag and drop. 
but we end up moving to the XML um, this is a little faster, a little smoother. So I advise people use constraint layout if you're coming from Xcode, because that's going to be the most like auto layout. And then um, drag and drop pieces on there and look at the XML that it's producing. The best way to learn that XML is that way. Kind of uh, teach I, yourself your observation. I, I also want to give a tip about the shortcut key in that one. So when you're in the Ooh. visual editor of Android Studio, Control, Shift, and uh, right and left arrow will skip between those two tabs. So you can like use the visual editor and then Control, Shift, and then one of the arrows, and it will skip to the other tab. It's super I helpful. I remember that one. <laughs> yes, that's where I use my mouse the most, and that would be way more efficient because I, uh, you, uh, if you find yourself jumping back and forth, that's real normal. Mm -hmm. So I'd say the majority of Android developers that I've watched code or that I know we use a combination of those two views because um, it's like it's it reminds me of Dreamweaver back in the day with HTML. <laughs> the drag and drop is great to, for some tasks, not so great for others. So when you need to force, you know, force the code to be a certain way, it's markup. You know, when you need to force the markup to be a certain way, the visual editor doesn't always understand you. <laughs> yeah, coming coming at Android from the iOS side, I really appreciate the the uh the text version of the graphic layout um we have the storyboard and the zib which is effectively an xml file underneath it but it's more of a black box and you really don't want to crawl around in there because there's just so much going on now on the ios side you can of course do all of your layout programmatically but that's more programmatic layout and that's avoiding the actual XML de definition to begin with. So I like seeing that the layout has a simple textual definition as well. And I'm really super glad you mentioned storyboard because it reminded me you're going to be even more familiar because the navigation feature um, that's coming prevalent in the Android. I'm guessing that's what we're all going to move to. Um, I don't keep as current on the recommendations as I should, so maybe they've officially said something. I've seen a trend, so of uh, the navigation, it looks like a storyboard, and you have your activities. So an activity is like a one screen of information. It's like a view controller. Um, you can lay them out in a visual way and connect them. And it's very much like Xcode Segway, Segs. I'm not sure how to pronounce the word right. Segway. Um, yeah, it's it looks more like that. And you um, you have a little starting activity. Um, and so that brings me to currently, if you're not using navigation in your app, how do you know which activity is your launcher, your main activity? So. Um, after you're familiar with your res folder, you want to know about the Android manifest that that exists. So a lot of people are, where are my app wide settings? Um, and that's in the manifest folder. There's a manifest XML that defines your activities and what code classes go with those activities. It um, usually define it doesn't define the style, but it applies the style. And that's where you put your permissions. So especially you're talking about location. Um, one of the places where my students get the most frustrated is you write all the code right, but then you, if you didn't put the permission in, it'll crash and it's not always obvious why. So I, I, permission. Yeah, oh, I think yeah. That, that one thing I would like to mention there also is the activities. You had them plural. So there's always been like this, once we got the, the fragment component, which is like that, sub UI part. There was a struggle between should we use those or should we have multiple activities? And now we're, it seems like we are all trending towards having a single activity in the Android community. Oh, and then multiple and that's fragments. Fragments. So just use fragments instead for all your screens. Uh, it will make the composition any easier and navigation easier as well. Uh, now there are people out there who would disagree with me about using fragments. But I think that most of the Android community would at least agree with me that a single activity is the way to go. Gen I like to hear that recommendation because I don't know which to choose. So you see the design pattern for the, for the one activity loading fragments. Um, yeah. So 
I'll do that one because I, I personally like fragments. It's like I saw those come into style and then fall out of style, and I was never sure if I was supposed to stay with them. <laughs> ben, can you explain what a fragment is just for, for people who don't know? Great. So if you think of a view controller as an activity, um, imagine a view filling a part of that view controller. That would be a fragment. So okay. it's basically a, a sub, you know, it's a sub view. It's like a, it, you can put multiple fragments inside of one activity. Um, a design pattern that's really common is if you have a tablet, um, they're much wider than they are tall. So if you're looking at an app in portrait, you could scroll a list, click the list, and it'll expand into a new page. Okay. But if you're in landscape, you could have your list on the left and your page on the right. So that's a good place where fragments are often applied is you can put your list in a fragment and your page in a fragment. You can tell it if you're in portrait view, only load the one. So you have a sort of master and a detail view. Yeah, so master detail view is a, is a good way to, or a good place to conceptualize a fragment. Um, but you can use them in all different configurations and they're just like a sub sub activity, I guess. <laughs> and they inflate from an XML view very much like the activity did. So you can create a layout for your fragment um, and tell your fragment what layout to inflate inside of itself. And it can be an area in an activity. And they swap in With, and out fairly easily. Yeah, and I did the Udacity uh, tutorial. I assigned it to my students for the navigation and it used fragments inside um, an activity and that way you know when you go to a new page it's a new fragment it doesn't load in a whole new activity and I think that's what Eric was mentioning so if that's the correct pattern to use um, I like that pattern yeah it's 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 <laughs> it makes it easier you stay within one single activity uh, you can def you can control the animations and transitions much better uh, it's also easier to uh, to do your dependency inside the if you use dependency injection it's easier to do the dependency injection on fragments than on activities uh, yeah uh, and that makes perfect sense because nowadays like testing is becoming more and more of a prevalent um, practice as you're developing apps and so you can see um, after you see the manifest you go to your where your Kotlin code is going to be in the Java folder and you go down through the packages and you can open up the code behind is what we called it in Visual Studio. But the .kt, you know, the Kotlin file, uh, that corresponds to your activity and that's where you're gonna put your actual code or start putting it. And there's some testing folders there too. So there's some test packages and that's a huge can of worms. So what I tell beginners is, uh, when you're first running an app, familiar, familiarize yourself with being able to put a log statement. And um, you, when you run your app, be it, put a log statement somewhere. Log.d will go to the debug channel. There's log.e, capital L. Every log statement has a tag and then a message. So you pass in two strings. And you want to go to logcat and make sure you know you can filter those messages. Because I've met many a frustrated person starting out and they can't send a log to the console or they can't find where logcat is. But for they, you know, we all avoid new things, or not everyone, but you know, it's common for people to avoid new scary things. Logcat gets avoided. <laughs> I, I've been doing, uh, I've been doing, as we like to refer to it, caveman debugging for a long time. We <laughs> put print statements everywhere, and in my app, I rolled my own system of logging to the console. And when I saw log.d, I was so thrilled because it follows the same paradigm in that my tags are my class name, so that every nice. one of my logs pops the class and the method that it's in. And I looked at log.d and I went, this is what I've been doing. Yay, I'm in the right, I'm in the right world. <laughs> yeah, and there ideally, a, oh, go ahead, yes. There is, there is a great shortcut also to remember here, command six, I think it is, right? So that you brings up the, the log cat view in, inside Android Studio. Mm -hmm. And there is a little search box there where you can type in both just a search string, but I even think it allows regular expressions if you're that kind of person. 
That is true. I've used I've used that too. So the I'm, I'm I've, sorry. I need a T-shirt now that says I'm I, a regular I, expressions kind of guy. <laughs> That's a special art form. I think you know regular expressions could be a discipline all of their own. Oh yeah, yeah. there there are plenty of books by, by I think uh, I think O'Reilly has one. Uh, um, well, I so my my editor of choice in the wars of editors is BB Edit for the Mac, and BB Edit has one of the most beautiful regex searches that I have ever seen. It, it's stunning. I use it for uh, for search and replace on on software. If I have like a list of things and I need to convert it into a switch statement, an in statement, a, a when I guess it's when in Kotlin, I can just blow it up with a regex very clearly and quickly. Uh, I love it's it. It's interesting to mention that because in Android Studio or the JetBrains tools in general, you can mark a piece of code or a string, for instance, and say, inject a language into this one. So define that this is a language. And it will add an annotation to it. And you can say that this is a regular expression. And now you can live in the code test that regular expression inside Android Studio. So it's super, That's super amazing. good. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> That is so neat. And one thing I forgot to mention about the layout editor when you're working with constraint. I, I try to I tried to compile some stuff that's like survival mode. This is where people get stuck. Learn about chaining in with constraint layout because for me, one of the turning points for auto layout when I was learning Xcode and I'm still not super great at it, but it was the little TIE fighter buttons in the bottom corner. Once I just uh, once I discovered those bottom right corner buttons, I was good. I I could do auto layout finally, because I'd been trying other means. Um, so once that <laughs> once that was came to my attention, you know, it was several hours of. of I'm like, sorry. I'm, why why can't I do this? <laughs> I'm laughing at the name Tie Fighter buttons because I love that so much. <laughs> they look like little. They're very cute, and uh, now I never forget. You know, those buttons are there. Those will help me with auto layout. And when uh, the aha moment I had when I was having the same struggle with constraint was when I learned about chaining. Now I can put two things together and make them fill, you know, the space equally or, you know, that's like if you want to vertically or horizontally align things with percentages and that sort of stuff, um, you can group select them and chain those suckers. That's how you can use constraint layout to make very um, more complicated layouts. And students, you know, people who are new to this, at least I did, um, I banged my head against a wall and you watch tutorials and yeah, sure, it's fine. You can make their layout and follow with them and get some from that. But when you're trying to build your own custom layout, um, it can be hard. So chaining was my survival mode of like, now I can make it look mostly how I want pretty fast. <laughs> so the thing I'm looking for the most advice on is not Kotlin. Kotlin itself is a fairly C-like language, uh, fairly C, you know, uh, it follows standard of object-oriented cases. It's fairly easy. It's the Android OS side of things, learning the different classes. And is there, how do you best suggest taking down the, the Android classes and nuances there? Like structure wise, as far as well, no, knowing grouping? what they knowing what they are, like in in uh, in, in the uh, demo app that I did for the hit me button, uh, at one point it says now we're going to put an alert together. Okay. And all of a sudden, there's this alert class that I knew nothing about. What is the best way, in your opinion, to start learning about the different classes? Is it just to do tutorials? and say, okay, now I need a class that does X, does it exist, et cetera? And I'd love to hear from Eric on this one too. Uh, my recommendation would be to study developer.android.com and look at common design. Uh, a, a lot of times, like um, I'll, I'll provide a link in the show notes. It'll have in the right-hand column, um, a lot of the common topics of like, here's the anatomy of an app. And that would give you an overview of what libraries are there. And um, I'm sure in Android Studio, there's some quick keys to jumping to the documentation as well. 
Uh, I, I, yeah, it, it could be, but uh, developer.android.com or as we see, say in the Android world, DAC, D-A-C. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so the guides section, so developer.android.com slash guide yes. covers almost everything that an Android device can do, I would say. Uh, that is the best starting point if you want to do something new that you're not used to before. And from there, you usually get recommendation. You start here, you implement it like that, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge here is that you usually get a lot of suggestions, different ways to approach it. And in some cases, that documentation, those guys haven't caught up with the latest thing. Uh, which brings me to the, the next advice I have. Get to know your local Android community or the online Android community so that you can ask, ask questions there. Yeah, definitely. And um, I'm a GDG resource and I'm, of course, you know, I specialize in um, beginners. So I am very quick to put you in contact with our local experts because, <laughs> uh, you know, we have um, GDEs in the area. I know three of them right off the top of my head who are um, hosting monthly meetups and you can um, attend their meetup and uh, if they don't know the answer they can certainly point you in a direction where you might be able to find it is there a gdg and, website because well i i am i'd love to meet the ones that you know but you're two time zones away from me yeah <laughs> and, so and if you go there's a few to, more than that yeah if um if you go to it looks like um uh, we can put it in the show notes but if you do a google search for google developers group there's a GDG homepage and you can search by zip code and find who's close. Um, the, main uh, the main resource in the United States is meetup.com. So they sponsor us to have a meetup.com page and um, we host meetups usually every month, at least every 90 days. And there's dev fests, which are the dev fests give us some code labs or some topics and we try to go out and teach them to the community and I, I provide pizza and try to teach something. I'd love to put together something about coroutines and hey, let's all do the coroutines code lab there, and learn about that and listen to Eric's talks on YouTube and eat pizza. <laughs> is there any, uh, are there any live online sites like a GDG Slack or something like that? Um, I know that I'm on a Slack for leaders. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, um, everyone. So there, pro there might be. So I don't know if the Slack is only for leaders or it's for community as well. Um, so yeah, there, there, are, there are Android Slacks, but the, the ones that are fully open uh, tend to be very noisy and it's hard to get your questions answered. Uh, so Slack is, the Slack teams that are useful are usually invite only, so you have to get to know someone who's there. Mm -hmm. um, and of course there's but, Stack Overflow. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's Stack Overflow, but you should there you should have like if the answer is older than a year, you should probably consider this maybe a bit dated, maybe. Uh, there is uh, Twitter is actually a great place to post a question if you post it with the Android Dev uh, hashtag. Uh, a lot of people like they put pass by in their their feed and they will be, oh they, I know that and then they will answer it and then they will maybe take it offline or you know take away from Twitter or other. Um, but yeah, the, the, the meetups are the key to get into the Android community and to learn more. Uh, I think that's the most valuable resource we have as uh, Android developers because the Android communities, the Android meetups are really great and there are so many. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's where, it's how I got pulled in. And what I love about it is you do pretty much, the, it is kind of a community that pulls you in via invite, but um, it's been a very friendly community. So uh, attending a few meetups, um, like Shuki, for instance, and we've got several GDs, they've been very quick to point me in the right direction, you know, introduce me to people and um, my students as well. So it's been a community that I found was very easy to approach. So yeah, the, uh, you kind of have to approach them, but. <laughs> yeah, the, the only challenge we have here, so here in Stockholm, we run it, we run it uh, like every month as well. We try to at least, uh, and it fills up really quickly. So 
we we had a time where where it filled up in 10 minutes every time we announced something so it's like <laughs> oh my goodness yeah and yeah. i'm in a small town so i'm lucky if i can get five or ten people at a meetup because we have three oh. cities that are about half an hour apart so i throw a meetup at all three cities and i get maybe five or ten people but oh. that makes our club you know maybe our clubs um can pull 50 people out if everybody comes, but it's a commute for everyone. Whereas Denver and Boulder, they can get 50 or 100 if um, if things go right. When we have Dev Fest over there, they can get in the hundreds. Yeah, yeah so uh, the tip is to, when you see something announced, sign up for it and remember to go. It, it, it will be Yeah. Right. And I meetup.com is a great resource in general, but uh, part of the reason why Android is um, my favorite platform is because that community embraced me quickly and pulled me in right away. And, you know, first I, the first thing I know is I'm going to these meetups and watching these cool people uh, play with Google Cardboard and they're talking about all the new stuff. Um, so they were some of the funner meetups I went to. Next thing I know, I'm going to Google I.O., I'm at these conferences, and you know, like, I haven't been embraced th that uh, quickly anywhere else, that's for sure. No, yeah, I would say that the Android community is very special in that way. It's more welcoming <laughs> than many other developer communities. Uh, and I think that Shuki is one of the reasons there, actually. She was one of these people who were like, this is how we're going to do it, and this... Uh, <laughs> Nice. She's good at facilitating community. Yeah. It's been wonderful. And uh, we have a few people, but she's uh, she's definitely, I see her all over the place and really good at building community. And it's important to her. She values it a lot and puts a lot of her own time and effort doing that. And I, you know, I, I bring resources from the college. I love how Google will partner with an organization. So I can have sponsored by Ames and Google. Let's all eat pizza and learn something about code, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it, you know, lets us from the developer world bring our own resources to the program. And that's really cool. Jen, the community in Google alone makes it really less daunting to me as I'm trying to dive into this. And I'm really appreciating the idea that that a lot of the information is really right in front of me and I have access to it. And a lot of people who are are welcoming even though I'm coming from the iOS world, which is <laughs> verboten and, and taboo and such, but uh, it really is encouraging. Eric, I want to thank you for joining us because uh, I, I know how difficult asynchronous work is in any platform, and to hear it from the Android side really was a lot of great information, both on the background, the history, and where it's developing to. Eric, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for yes. having me. Um, that's going to wrap things up for this episode of the Ray Wenderlich podcast. We'll be back in two weeks with, uh, our almost last show of the season. We've got Gabrielle Peel coming on the show and that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but until then, we want to thank Triple Byte for sponsoring this episode and we're going to head back to the Emerald Castle. Ray, back to you. And that's a wrap. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the RayWenderlich.com podcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and don't forget to leave a rating on iTunes. See you next time.